Hello and welcome to the Vermont Affordable Housing Show. This topic today is the coalition says goodbye to longtime coordinator Erhard Manka. Uh, I am Cindy Reed. I'm the chair of the steering committee of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. And with me today is Sarah Fleming and Talia Gunsberger, uh, who are both AmeriCorps VISTA members of the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition and our esteemed colleague, uh, 24 years of coordination time, Erhard Manka. Uh, who is soon to be the housing outreach representative at the office of Senator Bernie Sanders. We're really happy to be with you all today. And um, it's a big change for the Affordable Housing Coalition. And um, we're really keen on interviewing Earhart today and highlighting um, the, the very successful 24 year career that he's had with the coalition. Um, so first I wanted to welcome you. And um, then I wanted to say that today is, uh, this is town meeting week. So the legislature is on break. It's a great time to reach out to your legislator and your lawmakers and emphasize the importance of funding for affordable housing and homelessness, especially supporting increased funding for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. We're also happy to announce that the Just Cause Eviction ballot measure in Burlington passed with 63% of the vote. The Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition supports this measure, which will increase protections for renters and help ensure housing stability in Burlington. And I wanna let you know that uh, the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition has hired an interim coordinator, uh, Brian Pine, who many of you know, and he's gonna help us facilitate our transition as we search for a new director in the coming months. The next monthly membership meeting of the Affordable Housing Coalition is next Wednesday, March 10th, from 9.30 to 11.15. Hope you can join us. And now we're going to begin our, our interview with Erhard, which is bittersweet. Um, and Erhard just has a wealth of knowledge about all things housing, policy, funding. Um, he's really uh, has an amazingly brilliant mind. And we've been very, very fortunate to have him building this coalition for 24 years. Um, so Erhard, you are known as, an, as the expert on affordable housing in Vermont at the Vermont State House and in other housing circles. And we wanna know how you got there. What brought you to Vermont and how did you get involved in housing to begin with? Uh, that's that's a lot. And first of all, thank you for uh, the kind words. And yeah, this is a, a pretty bittersweet, um, bittersweet moment. Um, I, as I think I mentioned that um, Sarah and Talia earlier when we were uh, talking ahead of the show, I, I first moved to Vermont in 1968. Um, I was 17 years old um, and I went to uh, go uh, study at Middlebury College. Uh, only lasted a year. It was the 60s. Um, I'm not going to say any more about that time, but, uh, uh, you know, it, it was actually a pretty challenging time for me. And uh, eventually, um, after um, going to a couple of other colleges, um, spending um, a number of years in uh, northern New Hampshire and uh, also studying in Germany, uh, I moved to Burlington in the 70s, 1976 actually, to um, become a graduate student at the University of Vermont and have been in Burlington really pretty much ever since. So that's sort of the quick story of how I came to be in, uh, came to be in Vermont. Um, got a very useful degree um, at uh, UVM in uh, a master's in uh, German literature and philosophy, which uh, I haven't really used a whole lot, but I, I will, you know, I got to put in a plug for liberal arts education. Um, liberal arts education really prepares you for a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and it really helped me, I think, uh, organize my thoughts, uh, learn how to write well, uh, learn how to uh, speak well, and uh, be, you know, generally organized um, and uh, be a critical thinker. Um, but um, I spent several years uh, working as a carpenter, uh, worked for uh, a while for a, a, an employee-owned uh, um, construction co-op called Moose Creek Restoration, which uh, the buildings that I worked on uh, back then are all over uh, Chittenden County and, and actually all over Vermont. Um, but hurt my back, wound up getting a desk job uh, with the city of Winooski and doing uh, housing rehabilitation for the city of Winooski, uh, helped to rehabilitate um, probably, I don't know, 150, um, 150 homes uh, of low income folks um, and uh, um, worked with landlords that rented to low income uh, tenants and uh, learned a lot, learned a lot by doing um, that learned how to underwrite loans, um, learned how to spec out, you know, rehabilitation, did a lot of housing inspections, 
um, and also served on the Burlington Planning Commission and um, around the same time served for uh, four years as a city councilor in Burlington. And anyone who follows the city councilor who, or who's been on a, a commission knows uh, you learn a lot um, as a volunteer doing uh, all of that. Um, and, you know, at the time, um, there was, uh, it was a really exciting time because Bernie Sanders was mayor and uh, people were trying to figure out how to do housing in the era of Reaganomics. Uh, and it was a time when uh, things really, really changed. Um, you know, the uh, older housing models of uh, public housing, uh, you know, had fallen into disfavor. Um, and, you know, Reagan was uh, cutting the HUD budget and um, uh, cutting back uh, on the, really the responsibility of the federal government to help provide housing for our lowest income, most vulnerable people. So it's a very exciting time. There was a lot of colleagues, um, Cindy, we first got to know each other back back then. And, um, um, you know, there's actually a whole bunch of folks that are, you know, have been retiring over the last couple of years and that are going to be retiring in the next year or so um, that um, really cut their teeth in housing during the during the 80s. So we were all colleagues trying to figure out how to do affordable housing in this new era um, where uh, it just the landscape around affordable housing was was really dramatically changing. So we're going to take turns um, asking questions. Sarah, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, so we on this screen, I think, are all very familiar and committed to the incredible importance of affordable housing. Um, but I wanted I wanted to ask you um, how you um, started to see housing as as important and, and why you decided to basically dedicate your entire career to um, ensuring affordable housing for Vermonters. Sure. Wow. That. that that is a very broad question. Very, um, well, see what I can uh, muster up for that. Um, I mean, I would say, you know, really some of it stems from just my um, faith in human beings and, you know, the goodness of all, the essential goodness of all people. And that, um, you know, I, I've always felt like, um, what I have committed my life to is to try to help uh, folks to live up to be their best selves um, and to you know create equity um, in in the best way possible so that folks who may not have you know the same um, the same privileges that I grew up with um, and that you know many of us as you know as as white white people and as you know folks uh, in in a white majoritarian um, society um, have have benefited from. And so, you know, my, uh, I, I think my inner sense of, you know, of, of mission has really been um, to try and help folks, to help people um, and to uh, help um, create that level playing field so that, you know, people can live, live to be all, um, you know, all that's in their, their human potential to be. Uh, how does that relate to housing? I mean, housing is foundational. Housing is a basic human right. And without, uh, without housing, um, folks are, uh, they've got five knocks against them, uh, unless you've got that stable foundation um, of, um, of a home, um, you're going to have challenges um, having a uh, successful, uh, thriving, independent, uh, independent life. And what I guess what drew me to housing initially was working on buildings. I loved working on buildings. I loved working with my hands. Uh, I loved being a carpenter. Um, but had an injury, sustained an injury, and, and was not able to continue with that. And so um, doing housing in a different way um, was kind of the next best thing. And like I said before, it was a really exciting time of uh, ferment and a lot of uh, creative ideas um, were coming to Burlington. Uh, a lot of very creative people were involved in housing um, in the in the 80s. Um, I mean, this was, you know, when we formed the Burlington Community Land Trust and um, another organization that also eventually became uh, the uh, merged with the Burlington Community, Community Land Trust to become Champlain Housing Trust uh, called Lake Champlain Housing Development Corporation. Um, and we were creating nonprofits that basically uh, were mission driven and that were going to the, the idea was to um, have these nonprofits provide stable, affordable housing uh, for our lowest income folks, uh, folks who are, you know, who may have um, disabilities, uh, folks with um, vulnerabilities that um, that needed affordable housing because 
market-driven housing was not floating all boats. Um, market-driven housing um, was uh, has perennially been out of reach uh, here in, in Burlington and really throughout throughout Vermont and throughout the nation. Uh, and a lot of that goes back to Reaganomics in the Reagan era. Uh, I often think about how what we know is modern day homelessness uh, really was created in the Reagan era when uh, the federal government um, stepped back from its responsibility for providing uh, housing, affordable housing for um, not just folks with um, disabilities and uh, but for really for for working uh, working Americans, working citizens, um, people working at lower lower wage service sector jobs. As long as I've been involved, have never been able to afford housing without some form uh, of uh, some form of assistance, some form of, uh, of subsidy. And I, I think you know that's that's the part of um, that's sort of the shadow side, the the dark side of the American dream is that it's so out of reach for so many. Uh, so many people, but it's so essential for folks to be able to raise families um, or, you know, to live successful, uh, you know, in the independent lives, um, um, you know, on their on their own, um, regardless of what, you know, family choices they make. Oh, yeah, you got a question? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, for one, thank you for that. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, your journey from someone working in the physical construction side of housing to really becoming a state house advocate and um, just a little bit about where the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition sort of fit into that timeline. Sure. I mean, it was a pretty long journey because, uh, you know, I started working, uh, let's see, um, I started working in housing in 1984 for the city of Winooski. That's when I started. So, you know, we're talking, um, what is that? Thirty-five plus plus years ago, um, you know, my career as a carpenter was probably relatively short-lived, and um, it was, you know, as a result of a back injury, um, I needed a, a desk job. Um, and uh, you know, like much, like much of what happens in life, it's it can be kind of serendipitous. You know, you can have like a whole plan laid out, and then it's the opportunities to come along um, as you as you're living your life um, that sort of help. Uh, forge forge your path. Um, so, really, I learned an incredible amount working for the city of Winooski. Um, you know, learned about working directly, uh, serving and uh, assisting low income um, Vermonters uh, living in Winooski, both homeowners uh, as well as uh, as well as renters. Um, learned how to underwrite loans, uh, learned how to spec out uh, jobs, uh, you know, working with architects and contractors, learned how to project. I, mean, I knew a lot of this already from carpentry. Um, it was, you know, kind of, um, you know, it was not that, the work was not that unrelated to what I had done uh, out, out in the field. Um, and at the same time, um, like I said before, there were just, uh, you know, this incredible time of ferment with a lot of very creative people working in housing in the greater Burlington area and, and throughout Vermont. Um, and very soon, um, we actually formed the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition at that time, 1985. I'd just been working for the city of Winooski for a year or two. Um, Kirby Dunn, who uh, now works for HomeShare uh, Vermont, the longtime director of HomeShare Vermont, one of our coalition members, um, she and a fellow by the name of Jim Libby, who was then working for Vermont Legal Aid, later became the um, the uh, um, legal uh, uh, legal staff for the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. Uh, I would basically credit Kirby and, and, and Jim with uh, sort of starting the Affordable Housing Coalition. And it was a way for people who were kind of trying to figure out this new world of how to do housing in an era when HUD was drawing back, pulling back, the federal government was pulling back, um, when, um, you know, there should mention Northgate was starting to, uh, people were starting to get worried about Northgate and saving Northgate, which uh, for folks who are not familiar, is the, still the single largest um, affordable housing development in the state of Vermont uh, with 336 units here in the new north end of, of Burlington, and which actually provides us our office when, um, <laughs> when, when we need an office and aren't all working at, uh, aren't all working at home. Um, but yeah, um, the specter of um, Northgate uh, potentially flipping um, was was in the air, and um, one of the rallying um, factors was people getting together to to save Northgate. Um, and um, 
really uh, understand what some of the failures were of old HUD policies where, um, for instance, the developer of Northgate received a 40-year you know, 1% loan uh, and then a monthly operating subsidy to make up the difference between what low-income uh, residents in Northgate could afford and, and what were reasonable uh, operating costs. Um, after 20 years, that, uh, that owner would have been able to um, uh, prepay the mortgage and uh, get out from under all the affordability restrictions that came with the federal uh, the federal government funding um, and it was you know a stone's throw from the bike path a stone's throw from the lake and was uh, you know a time in the 80s when um, rapidly um, escalating rents were uh, placing a lot of people out of the market and a time when um, uh, condo conversions were happening so there was, I, I learned an awful, awful lot in, in a hurry around housing policy um, as we all analyzed and figured out what was wrong with um, the federal housing policies of the past. And as we came up with ways of doing it better um, and doing it in, in this new era. And what we basically came up with, um, including for Northgate, was that we, we created um, mission-driven nonprofits, basically an NGO, non-governmental sector um, that was going to do the work of that, that used to be done by, um, in essence, government-owned housing in the form of public public housing. I mean, that was sort of one of the main models was um, that um, housing for low-income Americans was provided through public housing, uh, through entities like the Burlington Housing Authority or the Winooski Housing Authority or, um, you know, our other local housing authorities around the state. Um, so that model had fallen into disfavor. So we basically created um, a number of nonprofits like what ultimately became the Champlain Housing Trust and actually Cathedral Square where Cindy Works had already been created at that point. Um, we also created um, uh, organizations that served the homeless like the Committee on Temporary Shelter. It was another product of the early 80s and of burgeoning, um, burgeoning um, homelessness in the, uh, in the state of uh, Vermont. And, a lot of this stuff happened first in Burlington, and then it kind of spread around the state and it proliferated. It was actually part of a national movement where folks were figuring out how to do housing in this new era. Um, and there were um, uh, nonprofits created all over the country, many other areas of the country. They're known as CDCs or Community Development Corporations. Um, and in, in Vermont, we basically put a lot of our eggs in the land trust basket uh, and created a policy within um, uh, within state government uh, so that uh, we wouldn't keep repeating the mistakes of providing, you know, sweetheart deals to private sector developers that could then flip properties. Um, we created um, the bedrock principle of Vermont affordable housing, which is permanent affordability. Um, and that you, um, when you put public dollars, be they federal or state into affordable housing, that, they, that housing had to be um, affordable for the long term, permanently, essentially, so that you didn't have to keep buying it back uh, from from the private sector with you know new uh, tranches of, uh, of 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 public dollars. Um, so it was a really it was a very exciting time, um, and we invested heavily in the land trust model for single family uh, ownership, um, and then um, the permanent affordability, which is a model for uh, permanent affordability. We now call it shared equity, and uh, it's not as um, based uh, in some uh, parts of the state on on the land trust model. It's now the shared equity model, where uh, homeowners get um, get a subsidy um, through state uh, state funds from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Um, and in turn for that subsidy um, to be, you know, the 40, 40 or um, some cases, $50,000. Uh, in turn for that, they don't get market rate appreciation. Um, and it's been shown uh, over, over 30 years that uh, the housing increases its affordability over time and that uh, people people move on they're able to uh, either they, some folks stay in shared equity housing for forever um, and um, will it to uh, to their heirs and other folks move on to market rate housing because they've been able to afford um, to save to save money um, and likewise with affordable rental housing I mean, we've had a lot of folks here at Northgate that um, be 
because of the stabilization of rents um, due to the mission-driven nature of um, Northgate's ownership structure. Uh, and it's true for all the other nonprofits that uh, own and operate you know, over 13,000 um, units of rental housing in the state of Vermont these days. Um, you know, if you stabilize rents and make them affordable, people are often able to save. Uh, they have that stable foundation. And um, here at Northgate, we've seen a lot of folks move into home ownership because we've been able to keep the rents low uh, and folks are able to save. So, yeah, I, you know, the, the journey um, to the working for the coalition, just to maybe complete that, that question, uh, you know, I worked for probably like eight years for the city of Winooski. Uh, and then for about four or five years, I worked for a small nonprofit that eventually got folded into the Burlington Community Land Trust. We called it the uh, Champlain Valley Mutual Housing Federation, uh, Co-op Federation for short. The uh, housing, the, the Co-op Federation basically provided technical assistance to uh, residents, low-income residents in the greater Burlington area that were looking to um, uh, own and operate uh, cooperative housing. So we helped, uh, we worked with uh, uh, Burlington Community Land Trust, like Champlain Housing Development Corporation, and what was then uh, also Housing Vermont uh, to create um, uh, co-ops like the Thelma Maple Co-op on uh, Archibald Street, um, the Queensbury Co-op on Patchen Road in South Burlington, uh, and the um, the Flint Avenue Co-op down on uh, on Flint Avenue, and eventually Rose Street Artists Co-op on Rose Street, and, and, and many, many more. Um, and also at that time, uh, the idea of creating mobile home co-ops uh, was in the air. Uh, I started getting involved in policy back then, um, you know, as kind of volunteer for the Affordable Housing Coalition, still working for the city of Winooski, um, worked on, um, you know, helping uh, to create the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, uh, bringing, helping to bring that through the state house. Um, we created the first co-op enabling legislation for housing cooperatives. Um, Vermont didn't have that, New Hampshire did. So, um, you know, worked on that in the, in the late 80s. So it really did um, a, lot of, a lot of policy work. I uh, started doing a lot of policy work in the 80s uh, and throughout the nine, through much of the 90s did the co-op housing work after we created that, that co-op um, co legis uh, co enabling legislation. And uh, once we merged that, that, that organization uh, was a small nonprofit. Um, it was actually turned out to be kind of unsustainable. There was just not enough room for enough, you know, um, Vermont's a relatively under-resourced state, you know, we're not a big state. Um, so it wasn't enough public funding to sustain that organization. We folded it into the Burlington Community Land Trust, which again, eventually became Champlain Housing Trust. And soon thereafter, I got hired on a part-time basis um, to start working for the Affordable Housing Coalition. And so that kind of brings us up to, you know, 24 years ago. Um, and, you know, at first it was a part-time job. Um, I didn't do a, uh, you know, trying to do state house advocacy for a couple of days a week, but it soon became really clear that to be effective at the state house, you really have to be there 24-7. Um, you have to be there every day. Um, and um, so, yeah, uh, within a couple of years, I was uh, I was working full time during the legislative session at the state house. And, it, you know, throughout the 24 years, I mean, one of the things that our network has really worked on um, and I think we really started the early aughts, like around 2000, 2001, 2002, uh, to really try to build awareness around the need for affordable housing. And uh, so it was a, you know, the strong network of housing uh, funding agencies and housing nonprofits that um, you know, grew up throughout the 80s and, and 90s um, really came together and created a housing awareness campaign in the early aughts that I think really was uh, foundational and seminal for the success that, you know, that we've, I, I think as a, as a network have enjoyed um, with housing in, in the state house. So Erhard, you have an amazing career of service, amazing commitment to service to uh, make the world a better place, especially for those who have less resources and less um, access to resources. And um, I'm just wondering what, and I, I, I assume that some of the your accomplishments are your contributions towards saving Northgate as permanent affordable housing. And really the creation of permanent affordability as a bedrock um, housing policy in, in Vermont um, to protect public investment to benefit long-term affordability. But I'm wondering what, you know, what other accomplishments just come to the top for you over your life of service um, in housing. 
I mean, Northgate is definitely up there, and, and it's it's not just Northgate because we had three other gates in in the state. So you know, Northgate went first, and there's Westgate and Brattleboro. I didn't have a direct hand in that, um, but um, you know, Highgate and Barry and Applegate and uh, in, in Bennington. Uh, but I think Northgate really charted the way. Um, the other the other thing that made Northgate so pivotal and and why I. I always feel it's a you know center point of you know one of the um you know things that i am proudest of having worked on is because um that lesson of affordability of permanent affordability was one that we learned from northgate and from the other gates and at the time that we were looking to save northgate um you know back in the 80s the state of vermont did not put any vermont taxpayer dollars into housing at all it was all federal pass-through money uh, it was from HUD. It was from what was then called Farmers Home, now USDA Rural Development. Um, so it was all federal dollars passed through the state of Vermont, through the city of Burlington. Um, and so at that same time, co coincidentally, uh, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board was created. Um, Governor, uh, former Governor Madeline Cunin backed it strongly. Her administration backed it um, because people understood that we had to save the affordable housing that we already had. We could not uh, allow it to um, to revert to market rate uh, market rate housing, uh, and so there was a symbiosis there between saving Northgate um, and um, and and um, uh, convincing um, the Vermont General Assembly um, that we needed to create a state uh, funding mechanism um, to um, put money into organiz into uh, housing developments like Northgate to save them. Uh, and that was the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. And I think, you know, we had the, obviously the unique idea of merging housing and conservation um, because when there is land speculation uh, and land prices and housing prices go up, the two uh, major casualties are affordable housing, uh, rents and, and property values, uh, as well as conservation of, uh, you know, farms uh, and important natural areas and uh, important recreational land. So, um, you know, we were the first state to do that back in the 80s, 1987. Um, and I would say, you know, uh, having a small part in helping to get VHCB through the state house, I would say is, you know, another uh, one of, you know, my, uh, my, my proudest uh, accomplishments, you know, working uh, with our conservation colleagues, uh, helping to create the Vermont Housing and Conservation Coalition, uh, which the Affordable Housing Coalition has been, you know, was key in helping to uh, to create back in the in the 80s and then you know just the long road of every year getting the funding for vhcb uh, vhcb is still unique as a funding mechanism it's a vermont grown funding mechanism that is you know able to be nimble and to react to um react to uh development opportunities whether they're housing or conservation when they uh, when 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 they come up without all the federal rigmarole that you get with a HUD project or you know with a, a USDA uh, rural development project, we've really created an amazingly nimble funding mechanism um, that uh, can also take some risks and uh, put in early money, uh, which is often the most critical money. Um, uh, Cindy, as you know, as a longtime housing developer, um, it's mm -hmm. always critical to get that that first uh, that first commitment um, before you start assembling uh, the seven or eight other funding sources that you need. Very true. Yeah. So that um, you know, I, I look upon that the creation of the co-op housing uh, enabling law, which really has enabled a lot of low-income folks who might otherwise have just been renters for the rest of their lives, you know, to uh, live in housing that they control through the mechanism of a, of a co-op uh, corporation um and i would say over the last you know you know that a lot of that does go back to the 80s and and, and 90s um what I, I think i'm most proud of um you know having worked for the last 24 years for the affordable housing coalition is just that incredible uh i think sense of goodwill that uh housing now has at the state house um and you know the Policymakers at the state house know that when they put money into housing, it's well invested. Um, there is a network of organizations that are ready to deliver, um, that are highly professional, highly creative, that know how to make the maximum use of hard-earned taxpayer dollars, and you know that um, that that really um, are able to uh, take rare 
um, valuable taxpayer dollars and make sure that they're not in some way wasted, um, that they're, they're put to good use. And they're put to good use uh, by creating thriving communities all across the state of Vermont, whether it's creating uh, new housing developments, whether it's uh, providing housing for folks who are homeless, providing housing for folks who are uh, seniors or folks with disabilities, uh, folks who are just simply the working poor um, and, you know, single moms working, patching together a life, you know, with uh, a couple of kids uh, through, you know, two, two jobs. Um, these, you know, these are the folks that are not aided by market driven housing and what our members do um, is, is provide that that gap uh, in the market that the market is just never going to serve. I think, you know, building this network and helping to um, advocate for the funding of, of this network is, is probably, you know, what I'm proudest of. And, and, and having that network really internalize the mission of um, housing um, some of Vermont's most vulnerable citizens, uh, folks who have experienced homelessness, um, folks, you know, who who have that lived experience, whether it's, you know, being on the streets for, you know, some folks have been on the streets for 10 years and they're now getting housing in Vermont. Other folks have had, um, you know, more um, shorter term, uh, shorter term episodes of, uh, of homelessness, sometimes, you know, recurring episodes. And, you know, a lot of folks are finding housing in our nonprofit housing. Um, you know, the proverbial three legs of the three legged stool, uh, capital dollars through VHCB rental assistance um, through through HUD or through state rental assistance programs and uh, supportive services through a combination of state and state and federal dollars. Um, but yeah, there's any number of individual accomplishments, but I, I'd say just nurturing this network and growing this network to the point where, you know, VHCB um, is recognized at the state house, you know, by uh, policymakers at all levels as, you know, just an incredible Vermont institution and where our nonprofit um, housing and homelessness network is recognized as, you know, especially now in pandemic times. I mean, this has been an amazing year where, you know, everybody has worked their asses off uh, and it's been a whole, all hands on deck situation and people have really, really worked hard, but, you know, we, basically uh, suspended homelessness um, for 25, up to 25, 2,600 people. Uh, and now, you know, the task is to get those folks into housing and to marshal the resources, to make sure that they don't go back to home. Um, yeah, that kind of leads into my my next question. So we, we've kind of, or your journey is pretty like easily traceable to this, like this change in housing where um, in the 80s and when you started, um, uh, public housing was being defunded and you were trying to figure out, you know, what to do um, to, to build a network that could provide housing for low income people. Um, and your work has been obviously instrumental in kind of strengthening that that network in Vermont of nonprofit um, affordable housing um, providers. Um, and so I'm wondering now, like um, looking at the current situation where housing, you know, is kind of in the public eye uh, more so than than perhaps in years past um, because of the pandemic, um, because it's so clearly tied to um, our ability to stay safe during the pandemic, having a home to stay safe in. Um, uh, what do you think needs to be done in, in this current situation? What are the, the, the biggest changes that need to happen um, in, in the housing? Um, world now? You know, that that's a really tough question. Uh, I mean, you know, housing is, it's resource driven. And, you know, we can develop as much housing as we have resources, uh, public resources, um, through, you know, those proverbial three, you know, major areas of investment, capital dollars, um, rental assistance, and supportive services. Um, what we can do is limited by how much we have in resources that are available to us. And I think, and I think this has been true for a long, long time. You know, we're the richest nation in the history of the world ever. And to have things like homelessness, um, because, you know, somebody, um, for someone not to be able to have housing is, something that really should not be tolerated in in this society that is this rich um it's a matter of political will um of creating those resources 
And really what we need is deep tax reform at the federal level, um, as well as uh, we need significant tax reform at the state level um, so that those with the greatest resources uh, and the ability to pay um, provide that level of equity for other folks to be able to, you know, to level the playing field um, so that other folks who may not have those same resources, um, that they get a share of that uh, in order to, you know, getting back to that they have that stable foundation and are able to build a, a life off of that stable housing foundation um, and, you know, create um, a life for themselves um, and for, you know, if they so choose to have a family for, for, for their family. Um, our, our priorities are completely backwards in this country uh, and they have been for decades. Um, we, um, our tax code is um, structured to benefit, uh, continue to benefit the wealthiest in, in, in the nation. Um, and uh, it really, it really needs to be, we need to, in some ways, we need to go back to the Eisenhower era, back to the fifties, uh, when we had a very different tax code. Um, and, you know, the wealthiest folks were paying their fair share and we were able to um, send uh, white GIs um, to college uh, and give them uh, uh, down payments uh, on, on housing. Unfortunately, you know, some of the, um, the, the inequities um, that have been built into our system forever were built by uh, housing subsidies. And I think that's one of the other things that we need to focus on uh, as we um, uh, advocate for, uh, you know, some restructuring of, of the tax code. Uh, we also need to make sure that the um, the harm, the deep, deep harm that has been done by governmental housing policies uh, to basically create um, the segregation of neighborhoods by by color, uh, by race, um, that you know we we all know still exists, and uh, the the um, uh, the disparities in uh, wealth building uh, that have come uh, as a result of governmental housing policies that you know that systemically discriminate against people of color and. and Black people. I think that's that's another, you know, that and tax restructuring, I think, are the, the, the two major things that um, really lie ahead that need to be done uh, in order to create a more more equitable society for uh, for everybody. And if we do that tax restructuring um, so that, you know, folks um, both in the middle class and um, in, you know, um, folks who are uh, low income um, and folks with with nothing get a share of the wealth of this country. Um, I, I think then we can build um, the housing that is that is needed and renovate um, the housing that is dilapidating, dilapidated. And and actually, you know, we obviously have problems with infrastructure all over the country, where our infrastructure is, um, you know, is, is is severely dilapidated. Our research and development is not what it used to be. Um, you know, we used to be able to send uh, someone to the moon. We can't really do that anymore. Uh, because we haven't invested um, in, the, in the right things in this country. We've invested in creating uh, a hyper, uh, hyper wealth uh, among a small uh, plutocracy that basically controls, um, it controls the tax code and it controls most of our politicians through Citizens United and, um, you know, we need campaign finance reform also at the national level. It gets pretty global, you know, it's all, uh, all, all, all of the above, but I think for housing, the challenge is we need more resources and we need to right, uh, right the longstanding systemic wrongs that have been created through, uh, through housing policy. So in that vein of looking ahead, um, I believe Cindy mentioned that you're going um, next week to start working for Senator Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'd love to hear more about um, what that work you'll be doing will look like and how it will complement and maybe even expand on some of the work you've been doing um, in your career and with the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Well, um, sure. Thanks for that question, Talia. Uh, you know, obviously, Bernie's been fighting for many of these things for decades um, since, you know, since he was mayor of Burlington. And, you know, he's been, I would say, probably, you know, one of my greatest political heroes um, ever and uh, is someone uh, that got me back involved in politics back in the early 80s, because uh, I spent a fair amount of um, the 70s pretty disillusioned with politics. Um, so I'm, I'm just 
incredibly honored and privileged to go to work for Bernie. Um, and, uh, you know, it remains to be seen exactly what I'll be doing, but I'll be part of the outreach team. So um, you'll probably continue to see me at housing events, uh, much like my predecessor. Shout out to Sheila Reed, who did this for a number of years. So former, also former colleague at Voices for Vermont's Children and a state house advocate. Um, you'll see me at groundbreakings and ribbon cuttings, um, but largely I will be um, kind of eyes and ears for Senator Sanders um, to hear, you know, what folks, what people's needs are um, and to uh, help, you know, percolate that up to, um, you know, uh, to help Bernie um, uh, forge uh, policies, uh, policy initiatives, you know, that, that help uh, Vermonters with with their needs. I'm also going to be doing veterans uh, issues, veterans affairs, so that's going to be kind of a new learning curve for me. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of it is just, you know, being out in the community. Uh, of course, you know, right now during the pandemic, it's going to be on a lot of Zooms, meeting with different groups uh, and finding out what the needs are and, you know, working with um, the DC staff and the other folks on the, uh, on the team. Um, you know, to make suggestions around policy, uh, policy initiatives. Uh, it's also going to be collecting, you know, what, you know, what problems individuals are seeing, you know, um, you know, you might, uh, veteran may be having difficulty accessing their veterans benefits. Um, so, you know, there, again, I'd be eyes and ears and then referring that individual, um, uh, that individual situation to one of the constituency staff to you know, to work with the bureau, the federal bureaucracy, to make sure that that Vermonter gets you know gets their due. So I have a two part question. One is, if you were to write a book, what would you title it? <laughs> About your years of service and commitment to equity and affordable housing. This was the trick question that uh, Sarah would <laughs> mention to me earlier. <laughs> no, I just thought of it because I'd love to hear the answer. And then secondly, you can get what back to us on that. Yeah, so. I'm not sure I'm going to have a quick, I'm not real great at uh, off the cuff. Uh, what was that title of the book of my life? Is, is... Yeah, or the yeah, book yeah, of your, <laughs> yeah, the your, commitment, your commitment to equity and affordable housing and, yeah. you know, change. Um, and then the other question is, this is sort of a wrap-up question, um, what advice or guidance would you give to someone who wants to start advocating for housing justice? Because we love having new people join this field, lots of work to do, lots of challenges ahead, lots of great work behind us. What would you, you know, say? I, I, I mean, I, I would say, you know, I'll tie this back to like one of the things that I'm, you know, kind of proudest of uh, is um, that we have created a network um, of younger folks that are getting involved in, in housing and that seem to be kind of bitten by the same bug, uh, you know, the mission, the mission driven bug of how important housing, uh, how important housing is. Um, so I feel, uh, you know, as I kind of look back and, you know, leave, <clears throat> leave this work, I feel like there's a really strong bench there. Um, of folks who are coming up. Um, and, you know, I think some of it is, some of it is sort of just an, you know, an inborn passion that may come from, you know, experiences that people have had in their, in their lives. You know, some of the younger folks I've worked with, you know, have come from, um, you know, uh, have come from poverty and have, you know, had experiences with, you um, uh, with homelessness, um, many um, are, are just, you know, already have the bug of, you know, being driven uh, with a passion for uh, creating equity uh, and helping to create equity in, in our in our society. Um, but I would say, you know, the first the first thing is I, I think you need to have a little bit of just kind of that inborn passion to you know want to make a difference um, and to uh, to want to help other people. Um, and at that point, you know, it's really, you know, whether you get involved in food insecurity issues or, you know, helping the help direct direct service, the direct helping service, um, the direct ha, direct services helping folks, uh, or if you get into advocacy, uh, I think the, the the kernel that's there is the the desire to help other uh, other folks and to have a passion for for creating equity. Um, but for advocacy, I mean, for me, it's been like learned by doing. Um, a lot of it is learned by doing. 
um, and and not to be afraid to take the plunge and make mistakes. Um, you know, housing is a combination of real estate. It's a combination of social services. Uh, it's economics. It's so many different things, and it touches so many different sectors from healthcare, uh, from physical health to mental health, uh, to substance use, to uh, economics of you know um, of, of, of low wage jobs, service sector jobs, uh, education, special education. I mean, there's no sector that it doesn't touch. So your entree into housing can be through any one of those sectors. And the first thing you need to do is kind of learn, you know, learn a little bit, you know, get that sort of housing 101. How does the, you know, how does the system work? Um, but then in terms of advocacy, it's it's really learn, learn, by, learn by doing. Uh, and don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, get familiar with, uh, you know, with policy issues and get familiar with uh, how the state house works and how the federal government works. A lot of it's civics 101 going, going back to like your middle school civics class um, uh, and really making it, you know, making it come alive. Uh, a lot of us had those middle school civics classes and, you know, we all slept through them, right? <laughs> or, or passing notes or <laughs> torturing the <laughs> teacher. You know, <laughs> I actually went back to when my son was growing up and, and, did that, you know, a couple of times. And, um, it's important to make that come alive. Uh, I think um, for for young kids, it's important to do that. I think it's important to go back to high school um, and do those kinds of um, guest, you know, kind of guest spots um, with with you know with young young kids coming up through the educational system um, ultimately. But yeah, it's learned by doing. Don't be afraid to make a mistake and. Um, Make sure, make sure that you know you do your homework um, and that you're as prepared as possible, um, and that you uh, always that you're always straight up, and um, and that you be careful to pick your battles, and that um, you got to be a junkyard dog because it takes years to move some things forward, um, and be patient. You've been a phenomenal and forever junkyard dog for housing. Well, thanks. Yeah. I, what I'll miss most is working with you guys and working with this incredible network of, uh, of colleagues uh, all over the state, folks in, at the state house. I, you know, during the pandemic, I just, you know, miss the collegiality of working with lawmakers. <clears throat> and, I, and I believe that Senator Stevens calls you, I mean, uh, Representative Stevens <laughs> calls you the housing boy. <laughs> yeah, um, he does. <laughs> He 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 <laughs> let you know about that, huh? <laughs> yeah. No, you did. I but did. yes, I know I know that you're you many are very fond of you at the State House and will miss your presence there. Um is are there any question is there a question that you wanted us to ask you that we that we didn't? Have we covered? I mean we've gone on for like forty five yeah. minutes here. How long can you have me yeah. speaking before I mean, there's, people there's tune so out? Much, Come on. Yeah, no, I know there's so much more we could say, but do you wanna do you know what you wanna announce your book? Cover, or do you want to get back to us on that? <laughs> um, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. Um, okay. There's, there, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not going to try that right now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I'm secrets, not going to add living. secrets from a junkyard dog. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there you go, Cindy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like well, more, more to follow. More housing, to follow. housing secrets from a junkyard dog. I like yeah. that. Please join us at the coalition to find out more about the plot. <laughs> well, Erhard, this it's hard to, to find the words to, um, you know, state our appreciation for your incredible good, good work and all the goodwill that you've nurtured and built over the decades. And um, more than countless lives have been changed uh, for your good work. And um, we, We'll really miss you and look forward to working with you in your new capacity. And uh, really glad to have this time today to hear more about the highlights as you saw them and the work that you've been able to do and your vision. Well, thanks, Cindy. Thanks for your kind words and thanks for your incredible support and collaboration. And you know, huge shout out to Talia and to Sarah who you know can over the last what's it been seven eight months now for your Vista service have mm -hmm. you know moved move the coalition forward another you know another large another great step and thanks for you know supporting the coalition and for your year of service that you're spending with, uh, with us. 
card. Great. And uh, for the for listeners interested in learning more about the coalition, we have contact information for you here. We have monthly membership meetings. We love you to join us at the membership meetings. We have a very informative website. Please get involved. Please help us um, move the needle on affordable housing. Thanks so and much. We're, we're a 501c3, so you can always donate.